Chapter 2 of the notes will describe how a procedure for developing theoretical models of chemical and biological processes. I want to remind you that all mathematical models of real chemical and biological processes are simply abstract descriptions of the real phenomenon. George Box encapsulates this in the quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. All models make approximations to describe a system. Our goal as chemical and biological engineers is to produce the most useful models. The models should therefore capture the features of the system that we most need to describe in order to accomplish whatever the modeling objective might be. We'll talk about developing theoretical models in three steps. The first is defining a problem. The second is formulating the model. And the third is solving the model. All three of these steps will be described in this chapter. The first step to mathematical modeling of any chemical and biological process is to define a clear modeling objective. The model objective should be concise and it should tell us how the model is going to be used. For example, if we were to say model a chemical reactor is our modeling objective, this statement is impossible to achieve. It doesn't help us to make simplifying assumptions. It doesn't help us to constrain, validate, or refine our model. And it also doesn't help us to discern whether the model that we've developed is going to be successful for its ultimate use. If instead we say, develop a model that predicts the effluent composition and temperature of a chemical reactor under a particular set of operating conditions, now we know that our model must contain information about the temperature and composition of the effluent. This is a much more useful model objective. If we say we want to model a chemical reactor, we might have to answer innumerable questions about what the chemical reactor does. For example, we may need to answer questions about what kind of sounds the chemical reactor makes, or what its terminal velocity is when it's dropped out of an airplane. But if we say we want to predict the effluent composition and temperature under a particular set of operating conditions, we know what features of the chemical reactor we need to include, and we can ignore many, many other features. The second step, to defining the problem is to select the scale and level of detail of the model. Commonly used scales for chemical and biological process models include the atomic and molecular scale, in which we describe intermolecular forces, typically length scales at angstroms and nanometers, and time scales at femtoseconds and picoseconds. We might describe things at the nanoscale. The nanoscale includes the behavior of very large molecules and macromolecular assemblies. At the nanoscale, we might include some long-range intermolecular forces, and surfaces and interfaces become important. At the microscale, we lose the descriptions of atoms and molecules. Fluids and solids tend to behave as continua, that is, their atomic and molecular details are lost. At the microscale, we describe the bulk properties and surface properties of fluids and solids. We describe phenomena like transport phenomena. The length scales are on the order of microns, and the time scales are on the order of microseconds to seconds. At the macro scale, we start to describe things like the internal parts of unit operations. Phenomena in fluids like turbulence are Time scales range from seconds to hours. Then we have the unit operation scale. The unit operation scale is the scale at which we measure material and energy flows into and out of equipment. Often phenomena at the unit operation scale are averaged over the entire volume of a vessel. This is the length scale at which we develop design equations for equipment like pumps, compressors, chemical reactors, and separators. And at a yet larger scale, we describe entire plant-wide systems. At the plant-wide scale, we may lump together blocks or sets of unit operations. At the plant-wide scale, we describe interactions between unit operations, and we use these models to describe things like process economics. The plant-wide scale can cover length scales from meters to kilometers if we're describing, say, a pipeline. Time scales might be from minutes to hours to even years. The distinguishing features of these scales will help us decide what kinds of phenomena we may need to include in our mathematical model of a chemical or biological process. A key principle here is that the details of phenomena at one scale, for example atomic scale and molecular scale phenomena, are generally independent of the details of phenomena at other length scales like the unit operation scale or the plant-wide scale. Now this doesn't mean that the atomic behavior has no impact on the unit operation. It simply acknowledges the basic fact that 
different phenomena are described at different length scales and time scales. As an example, consider the separation of a protein performed by column chromatography, where that protein is generated in a multi-step process. The protein might be produced in a bioreactor, the effluent from which is filtered before it's sent to the chromatography column. The unit operation scale is the scale at which we might design the chromatography column. At the micro scale, we might describe the particles that are used to pack the column, the fluid flow around these particles. And at a scale we might call the mesoscale, which is between the micro scale and the nano scale, we might describe the transport of individual protein molecules and their equilibrium binding and desorption from the solid surfaces inside the pores of the packing. The details of precisely how the protein binds, its conformation, its relative dwell time between binding and unbinding are only described at this length scale. Those phenomena are not described at these larger length scales. Nonetheless, the behavior of the separation operation might be coupled from one length scale to another by a single parameter or a boundary condition. Therefore, we sometimes use multi-scale modeling. In cases where we use multi-scale modeling, we often use a model at a smaller length scale to obtain a single parameter. Maybe in this case, it's an equilibrium binding constant. And that equilibrium binding constant might be used at a larger length scale to describe what happens, for example, within the unit operation. The details of what goes on at the smaller length scales are unimportant at this scale, but that equilibrium binding constant wraps everything together so that we know how the system will behave. At the unit operation scale, we might decide things like the diameter of the column. At the plant-wide scale, we may obtain parameters like the total flow rate and the composition of the feed and effluent streams, and those key parameters might inform our model of the unit operation scale. When choosing the scale and level of detail of a model, we must also decide whether the model will be dynamic or steady state. Dynamic models generally include time derivatives and result in ODEs or PDEs describing the system. The dynamics of disturbances and startup and shutdown of continuous process are usually described using dynamic models. Dynamic models might include linearization approximations to make a set of ODEs solvable. Steady state models make a different approximation. They often result in algebraic expressions at larger length scales. They're useful for sizing calculations for continuous processes. Most continuous processes never actually operate at a steady state, but at larger length scales, very fast and very slow dynamics can be neglected. The third step in the problem definition is to draw a conceptual picture of the model. This conceptual picture should include important material and energy streams. It should include transport phenomena that need to be captured by the model. And where possible, we should assign symbols for quantities of interest that we think will appear in our model equations. At larger length scales, our conceptual picture might be something like a block diagram or a process flow diagram. And at smaller length scales, it might be a control volume. We'll talk about control volumes in the next chapter. When drawing the conceptual picture, we might include important geometric constraints or simplifications that will ultimately help us to formulate our model. And often, we'll want to propose a coordinate system. The final step in the problem definition is usually to list assumptions. Assumptions serve several purposes in mathematical modeling. They help us to simplify a model as much as possible. But when listing assumptions, we should assure ourselves that the assumptions we've listed enable us to still achieve the model objective, which we defined in step 1a. Are there parameters that can be held constant? For dynamic models, which rates and phenomena dominate? And can we neglect processes that occur at much faster or much slower rates? Are there constraints on dependent or independent variables? Often these will be expressed as inequalities. When listing assumptions, we may also choose definitions or constitutive relations, describing, for example, properties of fluids or chemical reactions. We'll talk more about constitutive relations later also. In the next video, we'll walk through an example using these four steps of problem definition to begin developing a model of a blending operation.